underway for oh, more than 20 years in the uh, laboratory of Professor uh, Nicholas Hud. And I joined that laboratory about 12 years ago and uh, Professor Hud and I have been working together with a number of students over those last uh, 12 years in an attempt to answer this question. The, uh, the, how, did the, uh, how did life originate on, on Earth and perhaps at other places? And uh, this evening, I'm going to speak about the work primarily of two students uh, who have been working with, with us for a number of years. And that's uh, Dr. S uh, Sunish Karen Karan and uh, Dr. Tyler Roche. But before I get to that, I want to thank Elizabeth Coravillo who contacted me and invited me to uh, participate in this lecture. Uh, she was a postdoctoral student in uh, our laboratories for a few years back in uh, around 2010 and uh, contributed greatly to this work. And two of the papers that she's uh, a co-author on are, are represented here. But beyond that, uh, we got to know Elizabeth quite well and really uh, enjoyed her presence in the lab and her sunny personality and her positive attitude, as well as her scientific skills. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. Okay. I'm not sure in a chemistry lecture anybody has ever showed to you a classic painting before, but this is a painting by the uh, French post-impressionist artist named Paul Gauguin. And it's viewed as his masterpiece. And, and the subject of today's lecture, the origin of life, is a subject that artists and philosophers have pondered since their since humans became conscious that they existed, I expect. And uh, in Paul Gauguin's painting here, which hangs in the Boston Museum in the United States now. Uh, the title of the painting is Three Questions, and I think that they are universal questions that everybody has asked of themselves at one time or another, and Gauguin here symbolizes that in his painting. And the three questions are, where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, those questions are unanswerable, but nonetheless of profound interest. And what I'm going to try and do in the next 45 or 50 minutes or so is address primarily this first question. Where did we come from? <clears throat> in the sense of where did life on earth come from? Okay. Let's begin with a, a general timeline for life on Earth. And uh, this has been worked out in pretty good detail <clears throat> by a combination of the examination of geology, applications of chemistry, and uh, understanding of biology. And the approach that we're going to take uh, this evening in trying to understand where life originated on this timeline is going to be from the bottom up. In other words, we're going to start with fundamental principles that we understand from geology and try and understand how life made this first step from uh, a prebiotic earth to earth that contained life in the form of single cell organisms. And then over time, I'm sure you know that life evolved <clears throat> to multicellular organisms and then eventually to life as we know it today. Okay, how do we go about trying to answer this question? And the approach that we will take is to apply four primary tools. One of those tools is obviously the fossil record. As you are aware, uh, 
for hundreds of years, people have discovered fossil forms of uh, living animals in the solid earth and in rocks. And over the last 150 years, uh, scientists have pushed that timeline back further and further until today, the oldest evidence uh, for life on earth is over 3 billion years old, very old. We're also gonna look at uh, astrochemistry uh, because it turns out that some of the building blocks necessary for life, some of the, the simple chemicals that are necessary uh, for life as it exists today at least, uh, can be found in uh, interstellar space uh, in our solar system. And uh, it's, uh, there's good evidence as you will see that uh, some of those chemicals arrived on the earth as part of uh, the formation of the earth. The third approach that we're going to take is to use our knowledge of chemistry. And, and in fact, that's primarily what I will talk about today. Use our knowledge of chemistry with a knowledge of what <clears throat> chemicals were likely available on the early earth apply our knowledge of chemistry to that in order to uh, make an attempt to understand how those initial uh, chemical reagents might have organized themselves into something that was or could become life. And then we will look at modern biochemistry, the biochemistry that exists in living organisms today and try and connect what we're able to observe in model prebiotic reactions to the chemistry of life today. If that connection in fact can't be made, then um, maybe we're following a dead end. But that's basically <clears throat> the theme of what I'm going to talk about this evening, but the major focus is going to be on the model prebiotic chemical reactions. Okay. You know, probably one of the most influential scientists of, uh, of all time is uh, Charles Darwin. And his book on the origin of the species may be one of the most famous science books ever written, helped to explain how life on earth got to be as it is, as we observe it today. And you know, his major observation was that uh, life evolves from simpler forms to more complex forms by uh, descent with variation. And if you uh, <clears throat> look through the geologic record from the present time back about four billion years ago, about two, two and a half billion years ago, in the, this geologic record, you discover fossils uh, of plants or animals or microbes that existed at that time. And from the depth uh, of these fossils and from sophisticated radioactive dating <clears throat> uh, techniques, <clears throat> it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's possible to assign a date as to when the, uh, these organisms were alive on the earth. And so if you go back through time from the present to the Proterozoic era, uh, two and a half or three billion years ago, you can draw a chart of the evolution of life on this planet. But it's been said that uh, Darwin's uh, book, The Origin of the Species, is missing the first chapter. And uh, the question is, if simpler organisms existed before more complex organisms, what existed before the simplest organism? And that's a question that Darwin chose not to try to answer. Okay? And so it is up to scientists following in Darwin's footsteps to uh, attempt <clears throat> to answer that question. Okay, uh, how old could life be on earth? What is the oldest that life could be on earth? Well, the, uh, the trips to the moon in the 1970s helped to answer that question and provided 
a, a pretty certain answer to that. Uh, if you look at this photo, uh, this is uh, the results of a meteorite impact on the moon that occurred about 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, that was a period of time that uh, astronomers called the period of heavy bombardment. It was a time when the Earth and its accompanying moon were cleaning out its orbit from debris that uh, was residual to the formation of the planets. And during that time, there were huge meteor, meteorite impacts on the Earth with such frequency and with such force that uh, the surface of the Earth was molten rock and there was no water on the surface of the Earth because it was too hot. And so those are conditions uh, in which life could not exist. And it was only after this period of heavy bombardment stopped and the Earth cooled down and water uh, brought to the Earth by comets uh, began to appear on the surface that uh, life could possibly have arisen. And so that time was about 3.9 billion years ago. Geologists know pretty well that by 3.9 billion years ago, the Earth had cooled down and that water existed on its surface. Okay, so here's a timeline that tells us something about uh, when life could have begun and how it evolved, okay? And so at the present time, you know, in our short sliver of time on this planet, the last oh, couple hundred thousand years, humans uh, arose and became aware of their surroundings and worked backwards through the discovery of fossils, the dinosaurs, trilobites, soft-bodied animals, and all the way back to cellular life, which uh, is, has been uh, dated to about 3.4 billion years ago. So the earliest evidence for life on Earth that we have today is about 3.4 billion years old. Okay, uh, so that means sometime between 3.9 billion years ago when the Earth finally cooled and had water on it, and 3.5 billion years ago when we have evidence for the first life, life originated. And so in approximately 400 million years, the chemicals of, that are, were present on the early earth, the prebiotic earth, organized themselves and formed the first living things on this planet. Okay. We're going to talk today about biopolymers because it is the biopolymers that form the key to life today. They are the information transfer molecules, the structural molecules, the chemical catalysts uh, that underlie almost all of life's functions. And the first of these biopolymers to be understood and structure determined were proteins. And I'm sure that most of you know that proteins are strings of amino acids. In fact, in life today, 20 different amino acids connected, connected uh, to each other in a linear array, usually, by amide bonds between a uh, carbonyl group and an amino group. And, uh, you know, we're talking about 3.9 billion years of history, and it's uh, sort of amazing that the structure of proteins was determined uh, only in 1882. So what is that, 150 years or so ago? And so really, our understanding of the, the mechanics and the mechanisms and the chemistry of life on Earth is almost brand new, if you think about it, 100 years old or so, okay? Now, uh, 
there, there are a couple of things that I want to say about proteins, and uh, we're not going to talk about proteins in much detail today, other than to say that, uh, you know, these proteins are composed of amino acids. These amino acids are chiral. Okay? They come in right and left-handed forms, but I'm sure that you know that only one-handedness of these of the racemic mixture, of the mixture of amino acids, is present in life today. And that's uh, something that we call homochirality. And it's an interesting conundrum that we will address a little bit later in this lecture, lecture and that is, how is it that life became homochiral? There is one other point that I'll make briefly now and look at uh, in a little bit more detail later. And that is that the way that these uh, amino acids are linked together okay, uh, is through a dehydration reaction, a reaction between a carboxylic acid and an amino group that results in the loss of water. And that's a theme that we're going to come back to uh, several times. And it uh, maybe offers a hint as to how the biopolymers of life may have been formed in that it's a dehydration reaction. Dehydration reactions oftentimes occur in environments that are hot and dry. And so maybe that's a clue to how the original biopolymers of life got formed from the building blocks. In this case, the building blocks are amino acids and the biopolymer of life is a protein or a peptide or polypeptide. Second biopolymer of life today that we're going to look at, and we're going to take a much deeper look at uh, this biopolymer are the nucleic acids. And uh, I think at this point in history, uh, because of its prevalence, not only in science, but in popular culture, uh, the, the phrase DNA uh, is probably universal and known to almost every uh, person on this planet. And it is uh, sort of interesting that the, our knowledge of DNA as a culture and a society is only about 100 years old. And what's presented here <clears throat> are two views of DNA, uh, the biology view of DNA and the chemistry view of DNA. And let's take a look at the biology view first. When uh, Watson and Crick and Wilkins and Franklin discovered the structure of DNA in 1953, they are immediately recognized that uh, the, the, this nucleic acid polymer, that DNA, contained information, and it contained information capable for uh, its duplication. And this information <clears throat> was in a code, and the code was written in three letters, and those letters correspond to nucleobases. And in DNA, that code is written in the letters A, T, G, and C, standing for adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And DNA, as uh, I expect all of you know, is a duplex. It contains two strands, and each strand is complementary to the other. And complementary in the sense that adenine is recognized in hydrogen bonds to thymine, and guanine is recognized in hydrogen bonds to cytosine. And it, this duplex structure is held together by a backbone. These uh, nucleobases are oriented in space and held rigidly by a backbone. And in current life, uh, this backbone is made up of two components, a sugar and or actually a derivative of a sugar, deoxyribose. And what I will refer to several times is an ionized linker, an ionized group, in which in current DNA is a phosphate group. The ionized group is absolutely necessary 
because it confers the water solubility necessary for the components of DNA to come together uh, and main, maintain their solubility in, in water. Okay, so from the biology point of view, the amazing, the amazing thing about DNA is when the structure was determined, it immediately suggested how it can duplicate itself. This double strand can split and by some mechanism, a new strand can form on each of the individual strands of the, in, of the original DNA. And by using this complementarity of the bases, the new strands can exactly reflect and exactly replace the information that's encoded in the sequences of adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine in the DNA and make a new generation. And that information transfer from one molecule to the next or from one generation to the next is the heart of living things on this planet. Without that information transfer, a new generation cannot be formed and life would not exist. Okay, let's take a look from the chemist point of view again at the structure of uh, DNA. And I told you that there was a nucleobase, a sugar, in this case, the oxyribose, and a phosphate. And I told you that the phosphate we viewed as an ionized linker. The sugar we, we will view as a trifunctional connector, okay? So it's a trifunctional connector in that the, sugar, the sugar, and let's look at this one, connects three groups. It's connected to the nuclear base. It's connected by a phosphate ester bond to another sugar and connected by a phosphate group to the uh, second sugar. So this is the, uh, the chain, the backbone of the chain that holds the sugar together. It holds the DNA together. A sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate repeating unit. And then <clears throat> the nucleobases we'll refer to generically as recognition units. These are the existing, the extant nucleobases in DNA today. One of the questions we'll ask in a few moments is, were these the original nucleobases in whatever molecule formed first and eventually evolved to become DNA. So <clears throat> these recognition units might have changed over evolutionary time, as might the, the trifunctional connector, as might the phosphate group. And so what we see today when we look at DNA is we see the results of almost 4 billion years of evolution chemical evolution and biological evolution. And uh, the question we'll ask is, well, was that, were those the original molecules or were those molecules somehow changed over time? And is there a good reason to anticipate that that might be the case? Okay, I mentioned briefly before that uh, proteins were formed from amino acids by dehydration reactions. Okay, these are reactions uh, that I mentioned occur when, <coughs> excuse me. These are reactions that occur when two amino acids come together and an amide bond is formed between the amine of one amino acid and the carboxylic acid of another amino acid and water is eliminated. And this process goes on and each amide bond that's formed to make the protein, a molecule of water is eliminated. Dehydration reaction. Right. Let's look at uh, nucleic acids and nucleic acids, I'm sure you know, and we'll take a look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment, are comprised of two groups. One group is DNA and the other group is RNA. And we'll talk about uh, the differences between those in a little while. But the important point right now is that if you have a sugar, 
deoxyribose or ribose and a base in order for them to come together to make a nucleoside, a bond between the sugar and the base on the way from components to nucleic acid. Again, it's a dehydration reaction that has to occur, the loss of water. In the next step <clears throat> on the way to nucleic acids, if you have this nucleoside and you have a phosphate group here symbolized by this green square, in order to make uh, a bond between the nucleoside and the phosphate group, again, you have to eliminate a molecule of water, a dehydration reaction. And the product of that reaction, we call a nucleotide. It's a building block for the nucleic acids in life today. In order for the nucleotides to come together and form a chain of DNA, one chain in the duplex of DNA, each nucleotide has to go, undergo a dehydration reaction and in order to form the, the phosphate ester bond that links the sugars one to the other. And so the, the point of this slide is that the formation of the polymers of life, proteins and nucleic acids, these biopolymers, occurs in each case by a dehydration reaction. And so it seems reasonable to assume, and we do, that the first polymers of life, the first polymers capable of information transfer and replication also were formed by dehydration reactions. And although we're not going to talk much about carbohydrates today, I expect that many of you know that the third major class of biopolymers are uh, polysaccharides, uh, sugars linked together, again, in a dehydration reaction. And so we take it as an important clue that the reactions that occurred to make the first biopolymers of life were very likely dehydration reactions. Okay. How are these biopolymers made in modern life? And I expect that many of you know the answer to this question. And that is they are made by special chemical catalysts that we call enzymes that are primarily uh, proteins, okay? And so these enzymes uh, that occur uh, in living organisms take the building blocks. Here, these are amino acids symbolized by their one letter code. We don't need to get into the details of that, but these enzymes, these are called polymerase enzymes, take this, these starting materials, these amino acids, run them through the catalyst. You can think of running it through the factory in a particular order. And out of that factory in a specific order comes the biopolymer, the protein. I mean, it's an amazing uh, event, you know, creating order out of disorder. And these enzymes act like they are uh, little miniature factories creating polymers. Well, there is a problem, okay? And I'm sure you understand what the problem is. You know, in uh, American English, we, we have a metaphor called the chicken and the egg problem. And the, you know, it's characterized by saying, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And you know, the, the paradox is that if you don't have an egg, you won't have a chicken, but if you don't have a chicken, you won't have an egg. Okay? And it's the same problem here. Okay? In modern life, it takes enzymes, which are proteins, polypeptides, biopolymers that are very uh, complex in order to make new proteins and enzymes and do all of the other work that has to occur in a living system. But how do you make uh, how do you make enzymes? I mean, how could enzymes be formed? They're far too complicated to form spontaneously by themselves. And uh, if you don't have enzymes, you can't make nucleic acids in modern life today. And if you don't have enzymes, you can't make polysaccharides. And if you don't have enzymes, you can't make proteins. And so how did life get started if life needs enzymes, but enzymes were not present before there was life. And so it's uh, a classic chicken and egg problem. And scientists have wondered about this 
for a long time, approximately 100 years or so. And the first scientist to address this problem in any serious way was a Russian scientist named Alexander Oparin, who in 1924 hypothesized that the molecules of life form spontaneously on the early earth in something that he characterized as a prebiotic soup, okay? Uh, that certain molecules were present on the early earth as a consequence of the earth's formation and chemical reactions that uh, might have occurred in this early environment before there was any life. And he speculated that life developed from these molecules before there were enzymes. He did no experiments. This was a just a philosophical thought in attempt perhaps to answer the question that Paul Gauguin asked in his masterpiece painting, where do we come from? And uh, Oparin answered, well, we come from prebiotic soup, okay? whatever that might be. Well, maybe philosophically that's a satisfying answer, but scientifically it's not a very satisfying answer. And so scientists <clears throat> decided to try and replicate this process in the laboratory. And the most famous of the early experiments, perhaps the first experiment of this kind, or certainly the first well-known experiment of this kind, was performed by two scientists at the University of Chicago in 1953 uh, uh, by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey. And uh, it is referred to today as the Miller-Urey uh, experiment. And what they did is amazingly simple uh, and amazingly productive. And you can see a picture of their apparatus here. It's preserved in the uh, library of Princeton University. And it's a simple flask. And if you look closely, you can see that there are two electrodes here. And you can see that there's a distillation pot coming into the electrode and that there's a condenser here. And then whatever comes out goes into this pot, OK? And so they mix together a bunch of chemicals like uh, hydrogen cyanide, methane, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, 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 glyceraldehyde, other things that they suspected would be in this prebiotic soup that came to the earth uh, during its formation. And then they dis uh, distilled water through this and captured the condensate. And every once in a while, they would send an electric spark through this to simulate uh, the existence of lightning. And it didn't take very long. In fact, after a day or so, when they analyzed uh, what was being formed in this reaction, they discovered that amino acids were produced under clearly what are not biological conditions. And this was a uh, confirmation of this notion that Oparin had uh, made decades earlier that you know, from whatever simple molecules were present on the early Earth that arrived on the early Earth, uh, under conditions that uh, one could presume were present on the early Earth, the building blocks of life were made. And uh, that's a conclusion that has stood the test of time. Now, the original Miller-Urey experiments um, missed exactly what the conditions were on the early earth. They took their best guess at the time. And in modern versions of that experiment, uh, the results are even more profound that not only do you see amino acids, but you also see nucleobases and under some, some circumstances, sugars uh, being formed in this sort of this kind of simulation of the formation of prebiotic life, prebiotic chemicals. Okay, the second <clears throat> source of chemicals for this prebiotic soup comes from something called carbonaceous meteorites. And uh, pictured here is perhaps the most famous of these carbonaceous meteorites. It's called the Murchison meteorite because it fell on Murchison, Australia on September 28, 1969, and was rapidly collected. 
Carbonaceous meteorites get their name because they are very rich in carbon and they are believed to have been left over from the formation of our solar system uh, 4 billion years ago from the dust cloud that condensed to form our solar system. And uh, the interesting thing about the Murchison meteorite is that by analysis of it using modern uh, analytical techniques, uh, the uh, scientists have discovered the building blocks of life in uh, formed in present already uh, in this meteorite and it, after it landed on the earth. So not only could the building blocks, the chemical building blocks, the molecules necessary for the formation of the biopolymers of life form under the conditions that were present on the early earth, but the early earth was seeded with these molecules by meteorites that, come, that regularly bombard the earth and apparently can land on the surface of the earth still containing uh, these important molecules. Okay, so what are the molecules that we're talking about? What are the molecules that have been verified in this prebiotic soup? And uh, I have to tell you that literally there are hundreds of molecules of this sort that have now been identified as likely being present on the early earth. And you know, this presents a problem all in itself because if you've got hundreds or thousands of similar molecules, you have to be able to select from that mixture the ones that are the correct for the formation of the biopolymers uh, that it, uh, are necessary for life, but somehow exclude those other similar molecules uh, from this biopolymer that would result in a disaster. I don't know if it's popular in India, but there is this metaphor uh, that you sometimes hear in uh, the United States. And the metaphor is that if you gave enough monkeys, enough typewriters, uh, they would eventually reproduce the uh, works of Shakespeare. Uh, I've done a very simple calculation and it's not true. Right? If you convert the entire universe to monkeys and typewriters and you give those monkeys and typewriters the entire lifetime of the universe, which is about 3 trillion years, uh, they will not reproduce the first 1,000 words of any Shakespearean play. The numbers are too vast. And the reason that is, is that there's no error correction. And so a monkey might type uh, something like to be or not to be, and then make an error, and then they have to start all over again, right? And so this is an important lesson for the origin of life. These molecules in the prebiotic soup, sugars, nucleic acid bases, carbonyl compounds, uh, simple uh, aldehydes like formaldehyde, there are literally hundreds or thousands of them and there needs to be some way to do error correction in the formation of these uh, biopolymers. And what I'll tell you in a little while is we think we've discovered the way that this error correction can occur on the way to the formation of biopolymers. Okay, so here's another conundrum, a challenge or, or a dilemma. Even if we are confident <clears throat> that all of the building blocks of life were present on the early earth, we must again look to biology for clues for how biopolymers could have been formed before there was life, because we know that today enzymes do this. All right, so how are biopolymers formed in current life? And I'm sure that many of you know this already. Uh, it is what uh, Francis Crick called the, there we go, the central dogma of biology. And the central dogma is this, is DNA becomes RNA becomes protein. And you know, he said that in 1956, 75 years ago or so, and uh, 
it is still more or less true today. And the central dogma is that replication of DNA occurs spontaneously. DNA replicates itself. And we saw how that happens in a previous slide where the two strands reproduce each other and make a new form of DNA, a new molecule of DNA. The second process in the central dogma is transcription. So DNA is the instructions for how to make new biopolymers. And uh, RNA is transcribed. It is a copy of the DNA in the RNA molecule that is the working copy for how to make new biopolymers. Now, the difference between RNA and DNA is that RNA contains ribose and DNA contains deoxyribose. This is ribose, excuse me, this is deoxyribose. And you can see it's not really a sugar in the sense that a sugar is a carbohydrate through a enzyme-driven complex process. Ribose, which is a sugar, is converted to, <clears throat> converted to deoxyribose. So it is a ribose that is in DNA, the R of DNA. And we're going to see in a moment how important that is, the, uh, the change from ribose to deoxyribose. And then <clears throat> the third uh, step in the central dogma of life is that RNA is translated into protein. And proteins are the structural and catalytic components of, of living things. And you can see that in the middle of this process is RNA. And I'm going to tell you that in a moment that RNA forms a central part in the theories for the origin of life on this planet. And that occurred because in the 1980, biochemists realized that RNA could be both an information transfer molecule and a catalyst. It could act as uh, an enzyme. And they was given this name ribozymes. And so here's a, a picture of a complex DNA molecule. And I won't go, excuse me, excuse me, a picture of a complex RNA molecule. You saw that uh, earlier, the DNA in double-stranded helix, the relatively simple molecule, straightforward, you can think of it as a twisted ladder. Uh, RNA <clears throat> is much more complicated. It has single-stranded regions and double-stranded regions many folds, and it can fold itself and assume a very complex structure. And that's due to the hydrogen bonding, primarily due to the hydrogen bonding of that extra hydroxyl group that's present in ribose and is missing in deoxyribose. Right? And so the discovery that RNA can both transfer information through the sequence of bases, nucleobases in the RNA, and by folding into special structures can catalyze chemical reactions, led to the hypothesis that is today known as the RNA world. And the RNA world hypothesis is that the first molecule of life was RNA, that it developed from this prebiotic soup of existing molecules which certainly contained the components necessary to build RNA and that RNA assembled. And because it has the ability to catalyze reactions, an RNA occurred that could catalyze its own reproduction. And that was the beginning of, of life on this planet. Well, it's not a bad hypothesis and it might actually be true, but there is a problem, okay? And that problem is that even if there was a prebiotic soup with only the building blocks that make RNA, so you didn't have to do a selection, you didn't have the monkeys and typewriters problem, it contained only the components necessary to build RNA, you could mix them together and under no conditions that could possibly exist on the prebiotic earth, do these components, the phosphate, the sugar, and the nucleobases assemble themselves 
into anything that looks like RNA. That reaction just does not occur spontaneously under con uh, conditions that could have been present on the prebiotic earth. And so something else had to happen, okay? And uh, the, uh, there has been, oh, many, many attempts to find reactions <clears throat> or reaction conditions that would take components of the prebiotic soup and under some set of conditions, convert nucleic acid bases and carbohydrates, sugars, deoxyribose in particular, to a nucleoside. And only in the case of adenine has that reaction occurred, and it only occurs in 2% yield for cytosine, guanine, and uracil. In RNA, thiamine is replaced by uracil. No reaction conditions that could have occurred on the early Earth allow the formation of a bond between the uh, ribose and nucleic acid base, only in the case of adenine. And similarly, there have been few attempts and some that give low yields and the conversion of the nucleoside to a nucleotide by putting a phosphate on the five prime hydroxy group. And again, under conditions that existed on the prebiotic earth, there have been no really successful attempts to take nucleotides, which may have existed, and organize them, so, organize them so that they made a nucleic acid polymer. And let me just uh, complicate this problem and tell you how really seriously difficult it is. Uh, in all of the reactions that have been postulated that make sugars on the early Earth, ribose is not exclusively formed. Okay? It's formed along with dozens of other sugars from precursors like uh, carbon monoxide, glyox, uh, glyoxal, glyceraldehyde. And not only that, it's formed in all of its stereoisomers. And if you incorporate the wrong stereoisomer in making a nucleoside, you can't polymerize to make nucleic acids. And so somehow there had to be a selection process to choose not only the right sugar, but the right stereoisomer out of literally hundreds or thousands of sugars and stereoisomers. And so the notion, the traditional note, excuse me, traditional notion that somehow the components of RNA assembled themselves under some set of conditions to make nucleic acid polymers is a little bit of a stretch. And so we think that there was another way that this happened, okay? And that is, could a proto-RNA that can be easily formed, and that's the key, can be easily formed, have existed before RNA, and that over, over the time of chemical or biological ev evolution, you know, hundreds of millions of years, that this proto-RNA, this proto-RNA could have changed into the RNA that we know today and be the basis for uh, the origin of, of life. And in order to uh, examine this question, the formation of proto-RNA, we have to think about generalizing the components of nucleic acids. And I've already given you a hint <clears throat> about this. And so one of the components of a nucleic acid, and he was talking, talking about a nucleotide, is a recognition unit so that information can be transferred. Okay? And in this example, the recognition unit is adenine, but we can think of it generally as a molecule that by hydrogen bonding or by some other process recognizes its complement, a generalized recognition unit. Ribose in RNA today is that trifunctional connector. It connects to the recognition unit, the nucleobase, and it connects the two components of the backbone. And so there could have been another trifunctional connector that operated 
before ribose was incorporated into RNA. And the phosphate group, okay, we called the ionized linker. It is what confers the solubility to this component, in this case, the nucleotide, so that it can be assembled into the nucleic acid polymer. Okay, so let's keep that in mind and say that you know, the components of RNA can be thought of as three parts, a recognition unit, a trifunctional connector, and an ionized linker, okay? And so we just apply a little bit of logic, what uh, organic chemists would call retrosynthetic analysis, right? We can go backwards in time from where we are today in DNA and RNA, okay? And so we know that, or we believe that RNA came first and that when the proper enzyme systems were evolved, the uh, ribose of RNA was converted to DNA. So RNA is the precursor of DNA. And that because we know you can't not assemble <clears throat> RNA spontaneously from its component parts under conditions that existed in the prebiotic earth, that perhaps there was a precursor to RNA, which we would call pre-RNA, in which maybe the phosphate sugar backbone existed, but the recognition units were different and it eventually became RNA. And maybe if you go back even further, okay, the ionizable linkers were no longer phosphates, but some other ionized group and they eventually became phosphate groups. And if you go back to what we will call the proto-RNA, okay, none of these three groups were the same. You had a different recognition unit, a different ionized linker, and a different trifunctional connector. But if you look at it, the gross architecture of this proto-RNA is the same as the gross architecture of existing RNA today. Okay? The, uh, uh, recognition units are linked together on a chain with a connector and an ionizing group to, to confer solubility. Okay, so that's our hypothesis. Our hypothesis that RNA evolved chemically from precursor molecules that were easier to assemble on the prebiotic earth, okay? And so how do you test this hypothesis? Well, the first thing that we did several years ago is we just wrote down the structures of all of the recognition units that could likely have been present on the early earth. Literally, there would be millions of them, but we constrained ourselves to say that they resembled the existing nucleo bases in the sense that they were heterocyclic rings containing nitrogen atoms as the existing bases do today, and that they were appended with nitrogen or oxygen functionality, okay? And there are about a hundred of these molecules. These are the existing nucleobases today. And these are the four for a variety of reasons, which I'll explain in a moment that would have been present in the prebiotic soup. They are formed spontaneously by components delivered to the earth by comets or present on the earth from simple reactions. These four, which we will examine in some detail, we believe could have been the uh, nucleobases, the recognition units, the non-canonical nucleobases that uh, formed the first proto-RNA. Okay, so let's take a look at what some of these are. And I've already told you that the problem with the canonical basis is that if you attempt to do, if you attempt to form a nucleoside from the reaction of adenine, uracil, guanine, or cytosine with ribose, there are no conditions that give the nucleoside, the, uh, the product of this reaction in, mo in, uh, in reasonably yield, except for adenine. Adenine reacts with ribose 
to form the adenosine in 2% yield, okay? The other nucleobases do not make nucleosides. Okay, those uh, three of those four bases that I highlighted on the previous slide that we think were present in the prebiotic soup that uh, uh, I will highlight here are barbituric acid, triaminopyrimidine, and melamine. You can see that there are two classes of compounds, what I'll call the tricarbonyl compounds and the triamino compounds, okay? And there'll be a third uh, tri uh, tricarbonyl compound that we'll take a look at in a moment, which is cyanuric acid, which is also on that list and was the fourth of those molecules. Okay, but these three, interestingly, okay, interestingly, each by themselves or in combination, when you react them, when you put them in the presence of ribose or ribose 5-phosphate, spontaneously, just by warming, give nucleosides or nucleotides in greater than 50% yield. So the canonical bases don't give nucleosides. These three non-canonical bases present in the prebiotic soup react with ribose or with ribose 5-phosphate and give in relatively clean reactions, the nucleosides or the nucleotides. We've gotten over using these nucleobases, the first hump in uh, perhaps the formation of this proto-RNA, the precursor to the RNA. And I'm gonna point out one other thing and then we'll take a look at this in more detail. So I told you they were tricarbonyl compounds and triamino compounds in the melamine and the barbituric acid, for example. And you, uh, for those of you who have looked at it, realize that they're complementary to each other in the sense that they can hydrogen bond with, with each other and form complexes, okay? So here's another problem. If you take the canonical bases, adenine, thymine, guanosine, and cytosine, and you put them together in water solution at reasonable concentrations up to, you know, uh, hundreds of millimolar concentration, they do not assemble. They do not hydrogen bond with each other. And you can look at the reasons for this, but the primary reason is that the hydrophobic surface area of the duplexes formed from adenine and thymine or guanine and cytosine is not enough to desolubilize them in water. They would prefer to be hydrogen bonded to water than as the monomers to, to hydrogen bond with themselves. However, these four now, we've added cyanuric acid, non-canonical bases, okay, do hydrogen bond with each other, not as duplexes, but as hexamers. So they com are com composed of three components. So if we look at a color code here and look at the triamino compound, in this case, melamine, there are one, two, three of those. And if you look at the triketo compound, okay, uh, cyanuric acid or barbituric acid, there are one, two, three of those arranged in what we call a hexameric rosette. And uh, we've got a linker group on there to solubilize them. And I'll show you in a moment exactly what that linker group is. But the surface area, the hydrophobic surface area of these hexamers now is sufficiently large that they hydrogen bond with each other and prefer to stack one on top of the other to make long chains of supramolecular polymers. That means that they are polymers, but each of these hexameric rosettes is not covalently bound to the uh, ones adjacent to it. And we can do atomic force microscopy, and we can see long chains, micron long chains of these supramolecular polymers assembled in water spontaneously uh, at the right temperature and at the right pH. Okay, how do we know what the structure of these supramolecular polymers are? Well, <clears throat> last year, maybe the year before now, we obtained uh, X-ray 
uh, fiber diffraction patterns of these polymers. Mm -hmm. And through a lot of work, mostly done by Professor Hood, we were able to solve the structure of uh, the fiber diffraction pattern. And you can see various views of these polymers. This is uh, looking uh, at the chain. This is a little bit closer view. This is looking down from the top. And this is looking at the tails, okay? Now I told you that these were substituted and they were substituted by an ionized group. In this case, uh, a, a carboxylic acid and the pH of the experiment, the carboxylic acid is a carboxylate and it's on the cyanuric acid. And so this is probably not a naturally occurring compound. This was probably not present in the prebiotic soup, but you will see in a little while that we have progressed so that we can spontaneously form molecules that also form these assemblies that could have been present in the prebiotic soup. These are beautiful structures, self-organizing structures. They come together. They look a little bit like nucleic acid polymers, except there's no covalent bond between them. The uh, hexameric rosettes are 3.4 angstroms apart. And because of these tails, there is a 15 degree twist from one layer of uh, the uh, supermolecular polymer to the other. So it uh, has a chiral sense to it. And we'll come back to the meaning of that in a moment. Okay, now, uh, you can't have <clears throat> an informational containing molecule that is a supermolecular polymer because they come apart too easily. And so in some of our most recent work, what we've been trying to demonstrate is that we can convert the supermolecular polymers that are just stacked one on top of the other for lengths of microns into covalent polymers mm -hmm. by appending the appropriate chain, the appropriate tail on these molecules so that some chemical reaction can link up these tails and form the equivalent of the backbone of existing nucleic acid polymers. And you remember that backbone is uh, the sugar phosphate group, uh, a trifunctional connector and a ionized linker. And shown below here are again the structures of these four nucleic acids and some of the uh, linker groups that we have put in place, okay? And perhaps one of the more interesting linker group is what we call TARC, in which a ribose spontaneously reacts with uh, cyanuric acid, okay? Okay, so the question is, can, we, uh, can, can these assemblies be converted to covalent polymers? And uh, the answer is, uh, of course, yes, we can do it, okay? And uh, so Nish very recently has taken <clears throat> one of these recognition units and connected to it a trifunctional connector and an ionized group, which is a, simply a dipeptide. And this was not done under prebiotic conditions. This was done by chemical synthesis in the laboratory. And we are currently working on uh, trying to find conditions where molecules of this sort will form, form sponta spontaneously, okay? But we wanted to uh, carry out what we call the existence proof. So we know that we have supermolecular polymers, but we don't know that the covalent polymer exists, could exist. It could be that the bond angles are all wrong or that the structure would change completely if we tried to link up the groups. And so what Sunish did is he made this compound, the recognition unit, the trifunctional connector, you can see it can be connected through an, uh, an amide bond with another one of itself. 
and then formed assemblies, hexameric assemblies, these rosettes, by uh, adding cyanuric acid. And the structure of this you should now be a familiar structure to you is this hexameric rosette assembly that has three each of these recognition units. They stack one on top of the other, okay? And uh, they are chiral. Well, we start with uh, one enantiomer of the uh, trifunctional connector and they have a CD spectrum. And when they are treated with carbodiamid, EDC, they polymerize, okay? And so, uh, in fact, we see up to maybe 16 or 18 MERS in, in the polymerization. And so this is the existence proof. This says that at least under chemical conditions, non-prebiotic uh, conditions, these polymers exist. And so now we have a challenge before us, and that is, can we take these molecules or similar molecules and uh, not using chemical conditions in a laboratory, but under conditions that uh, would have existed prebiotically on the earth, form this sort of molecule? And can we convert them under some conditions to covalent bonds? Okay. Let me change topics just briefly for a little while. And uh, from time to time, I've mentioned chirality. And that today, uh, as you probably know, life is chiral. It uh, contains D but not L nucleotides, and it contains L but not D amino acids. And of course, it has to be chiral because uh, you know the, the usual metaphor is you can have uh, right-handed hands and gloves and left-handed hands and gloves, but you can't put a right-handed hand into a left-handed glove. It just doesn't work. And so in order for life to come together, they all have to be of the same uh, chirality. And so there's been a, a, a deep question for a long time, and a lot of people have tried to answer it, and that is how did homo chirality in biology arise from a pool of racemic and achiral chemicals. It has been a puzzle and there have been dozens of uh, possible solutions, okay? All of them remain somewhat speculative. But here we can show that homochirality arises simply and naturally in a non-covalent polymer that may be a model for a proto-RNA. And what I'm going to tell you is uh, that this is a possible solution to the monkeys and typewriters problem, which is, by that I mean, it's a solution to how error correction could have, uh, could have occurred and uh, so that the right molecules could have been assembled and that the wrong molecules could have been eliminated from <clears throat> the formation of that proto-RNA. So here's the story, and it's a really a, a very interesting story. So we take two of these uh, non-canonical nucleobases, uh, triaminopyrimidine and uh, the cyanuric acid, and you've seen this before, this is a cyanuric acid uh, connected with a six carbon carboxylic acid, the ionizing linker, we call that cyclo six. And what you know already, is that if we mix these two together, 15 millimolar concentration, room temperature, they assemble into these hexameric rosettes, they stay soluble because of the ionizing linkers, okay? And they stack what on top of each other to form these supramolecular polymers. And we uh, were quite surprised. In fact, <clears throat> when uh, this observation was first made, it was made by Sunish. Uh, he came and showed us that, well, you know, when I take these achiral molecules, so these are achiral molecules, there's no chiral center in any of these molecules. When I take them and make these assemblies, and I take a circular dichroism spectrum of the assembly, it's there. So achiral molecules have formed something that is chiral. We have broken symmetry. How could that be? So I, the first, my first response was, I said, uh, Sunish, 
this must be an artifact of some kind. You must have sneezed or something the day that you made these samples and that somehow you contaminated the samples with chiral contaminants. And the reason that you see a circular dichroism spectrum is that it's contaminated. Well, Sunish did that experiment many times. And uh, in fact, here's a representative 39 times uh, that he did the experiment. And he measured the CD spectrum 39 times or 40 times or whatever it was. And among the, those samples, 40 samples, 21 showed a positive CD spectrum and 19 showed a negative CD spectrum. Or in other words, you can say that when you, when you looked at the CD spectrum of the gel, that was formed by these supermolecular polymers, 50% of the time you got a P helix, a left-handed helix, and 50% of the time you got an M helix, a right-handed helix, okay? So it couldn't be an artifact. It, was, it seemed like it was sort of random. And when we took a closer look at this by electron microscopy, we could see <clears throat> that in the samples, there were these different helixes uh, uh, easily apparent. So this is the actual image that we got from the electron microscopy. And this is our artist representation of, of what we are seeing, okay? Now, uh, there's something here that's pretty interesting. And remember I told you in the prebiotic soup, there are, uh, let's focus on sugars, you know, uh, a bunch of sugars uh, of uh, all different possible uh, stereoisomers. Well, only one stereoisomer will fit in this, uh, in this helix. The other hand in this will fit in, in the opposite helix, but only one will assemble in the helix. And remember, these are not held together by covalent bonds. And remember that these are equilibrium structures, which means that they're energy minima. So you could uh, imagine in this chemical process, in this prebiotic soup, there is selection going on, that these non-covalent polymers made up of these hexameric rosettes stacked on each other form and disassemble millions and millions of times until the right one is formed by accident and the right one can stack. And that stacking then preserves them, protects them from dissociation because the stacked form is the thermodynamic minimum. And so this is the error correction. This is the way that the wrong enantiomer, the wrong compound, it comes out, it is removed from uh, the supermolecular polymer that could become the proto-RNA. Well, how is it that symmetry is broken? How is it that you get uh, chiral compounds from achiral uh, starting materials? And so we constructed the spectrometer and I won't take you through the details of the construction of the spectrometer, but the uh, important point is that we can take a CD spectrum on uh, a sample and the diameter of the spot on the CD spectrum is 0.8 millimeters. And we can go through the sample and take uh, these uh, CD spectrum spectra of the sample at various locations in, uh, in the sample. And the result of that explained what was going on here. So again, you see uh, Psycho-6 and uh, triimmunopyrimidine and they come together and they make uh, these assemblies of 50% one hand in this, 50% of the other hand in this. But if we look at this entire sample and the sample is 30 millimeters by six millimeters and we scan through the entire sample measuring the CD spectrum, you can see approximately half the, simple, the sample has a positive CD spectrum and half of the sample has a negative CD spectrum. So in fact, what we, have, we haven't broken symmetry. What we have done is we have created domains, okay? In this sample, some domains have positive CD spectra, some domains have negative CD spectra, but if you integrate over the entire sample, there are as many positive domains as there are negative domains, and so symmetry is preserved. 
But the interesting thing is that there are trillions and trillions and trillions of molecules in one of these domains. And so you could imagine that in this domain okay, of one handedness of one chirality by accident, there is among those trillions of molecules, one that is capable of making covalent bonds and is preserved. And that one is the precursor to that proto RNA. Okay, precursor to the proto RNA. So I told you a story about how we think that molecules in the prebiotic soup could have come together, formed assemblies. These assemblies make supramolecular uh, uh, polymers, and that uh, by some process, which we are still exploring, these supramolecular polymers became covalent polymers, and we know that these covalent polymers or covalent polymers like them can exist. But there's another part to this mystery, and that is sugars. Okay, and uh, I just want to tell you in the last part of this story that we think we have solved uh, the mystery of how sugars and the right sugars, and particularly ribose arose on the early earth. And this work has just been submitted for publication. And I won't take you through the details of this because it's relatively complex, but while it is complex, it is actually quite simple. Simple organic chemistry, simple ketone chemistry, most of which has been known for a long time. And so it starts at the beginning, okay? And the beginning is that glyceraldehyde, right? A very simple molecule is known to be formed in comets and other sources. <clears throat> and so that we can assume pretty confidently that glyceraldehyde was present on the early earth uh, as part of the prebiotic soup. And it's, a, it's a simple molecule. And it would exist in uh, two enantiomers, two enantiomeric forms, but you already see that we have a, a mechanism for selection of, of the proper enantiomer. So I'll just show one enantiomer here. And in a series of isomerization and condensation reactions, we've shown that under plausibly prebiotic conditions, basically just warming a slightly basic solution of glyceraldehyde, just glyceraldehyde, that a series of isomerizations occur and that uh, among the products formed in this uh, isomerizing mixture, is ribose, shown here in its linear form, and glucose. And there, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, diastereomers, arabinose, and mannose, which have the wrong stereochemistry, okay? But they're formed along with uh, ribose and glucose. Ribose and glucose, you probably recognize, are key molecules in living systems today. And here's an interesting thing. If we include barbituric acid or triaminopyrimidine, okay, two of the pre uh, non canonical bases that we've identified and that we've been looking at, include those in this reaction. Just throw in a little barbituric acid with the glyceraldehyde, carry out this reaction uh, and just by warming and heating it for uh, a few hours, out come nucleosides, okay. So the nucleosides are formed from <clears throat> the uh, isomerization of the ketoses that are formed in the first reactions of glyceraldehyde. Those ketoses isomerize to aldoses. And for those of you who have studied organic chemistry, you recognize that aldehyde carbonyl groups are much more reactive generally than ketone carbonyl groups. And then this equilibrium between ribulose, which is first formed, and arabinose and ribose, which are in equilibrium, the barbituric acid drains this equilibrium, mm -hmm. drains this equilibrium to form nucleosides. So Basically, you have an equilibrating mixture of these sugars, and as they equilibrate in the presence of barbituric acid, nucleosides come out. And we have shown that nucleosides of barbituric acid form uh, hexameric rosettes and uh, assemblies 
with their complementary base repair. Okay, so that brings me basically to the end of uh, the chemical discussion uh, for today. And so I just want to summarize, what have we learned so far? How far along are we in the understanding of what the chemical origins of life on Earth might have been, okay? And so I just want to make four points, okay? That non-canonical nuclear bases likely present in the prebiotic soup, melamine, barbituric, and acids and others. And you've seen the hundred or so that we have looked at, and these four are the ones that we're focusing on right now. That these react with sugars, ribose and uh, others, that were also likely present on the prebiotic earth. So you remember, I told you earlier that the, uh, the canonical bases that exist today, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil, basically do not react with sugars to make nucleosides, but these do. Uh, what's more, these nucleosides assemble into chiral non-covalent polymers that resemble DNA, resemble DNA in, uh, excuse me, resemble RNA in the sense that they're long linear polymers that contain a recognition unit held together by complementary hydrogen bonding and uh, contain an, uh, a linker and an ionizable group. And we have shown, but not under prebiotic conditions, that these uh, non-covalent polymers, these supramolecular polymers, can be converted to covalent polymers. And that's basically where we are today. Our uh, current attempts are to show that we can take these non-covalent polymers and uh, convert them to covalent polymers under prebiotic conditions, and that these non-covalent polymers, these uh, nucleosides are, can be formed with appropriate groups that are also under prebiotic conditions. And of course, the question that we're trying to address is could these polymers be related to the proto-RNA that by chemical evolution gave rise to the RNA world and eventually to life as we know it today? And I have to tell you, you know, uh, we think we've made very good progress in answering the, the question. So, you know, to come back to this timeline of the existence of the earth, and here we are today, and here is the earth 4 billion years ago, molten rock, cools down, and in between 3.9 and 3.5 billion years ago, for over 400 million years, chemistry occurred and out popped cellular life. And maybe, maybe our approach, the approach that just as humans have evolved from different forms that were on the earth a long time ago, the biopolymers of life have also evolved from those that were on the earth a long time ago. And that from this proto-RNA that contained different recognition units, different trifunctional connectors, a different ionized linker through chemical evolution eventually became the RNA that sparked life on this planet, okay? That's where we are. I want to uh, leave you maybe with a little bit of a philosophical thought. You know, we started off talking about art and philosophy. And, you know, I've told you that life is believed to have started in water and that the biopolymers of life, uh, proteins, nucleic acids, and sugars are all formed from dehydration reactions. And so perhaps it was a cycle of a wet environment drying out and then becoming wet again that led to life. And that you know, on the, in the dry environment, dehydrations occurred and uh, biopolymer synthesis happened. And then when it became wet, when it rained, the catalytic reactions of biopolymers happened, they replicated, and this process was repeated many, many times. And so anytime you're walking outside and you see a wet puddle somewhere and you watch it dry under the hot sun, maybe what you're looking at are the processes that billions of years ago gave rife, 
gave rise to life and gave rise to you and I. And maybe that's the answer to the question that Paul Gauguin asked, where do we come from? We come from a mud puddle. Okay, so all that's left for me to do is to uh, thank you for your attention this evening, uh, to tell you that uh, the bulk of this work was done uh, at Georgia Tech in what we call the Center for Chemical Evolution, which was funded by the US National Science Foundation and the United States National uh, Associ uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA is very interested in the origin of life because they want to know what to look for on other planets. And uh, again, this is uh, my colleague and, and good friend, Nick Hudd. The work that I talked to you about, the carbohydrate work was primarily done by uh, Tyler Roche. The uh, assembly, the uh, polymerization and the chiral studies were done by uh, Sunish. Okay, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful, interesting and informative lecture. Now, the session is open for discussion. Participants can ask their doubts either in the chat box or they can unmute their sir. Gary, very interesting talk. Uh, can you hear me, uh, Professor Gary? Yes, I can hear you fine, thank you. Yeah. You know, I have two, two short questions. You talked about the, uh, the prebiotic soup theories, very interesting. Is the miller ure theory widely accepted, Gary? Is it widely accepted theory? Uh, not the original experiment, okay? The original experiment got the conditions on the early Earth wrong, okay? In that the conditions on the early Earth are now understood to be uh, reducing and that there was no oxygen present or the oxygen concentration yeah. on the early Earth was very low, okay? And so uh, the initial experiment, uh, the first experiment, the Miller-Urey experiment got the conditions wrong. However, there have been numerous replications of that experiment under uh, conditions which more uh, reliably uh, mimic those conditions which we today understand to be uh, present on the early earth. And they give similar results. They give different sets of compounds, but it's the same idea that amino acids show up very quickly and uh, nucleic acid bases show up very quickly in, in these experiments. And that in other experiments, you know, the most famous one is something called the foremost reaction, uh, that you take formaldehyde and yes. uh, cook it together and out come a whole slew of uh, sugars and uh, and other compounds. And so the building blocks were there. They either came from you know, uh, the formation of the earth and, or were formed rapidly by non-biological processes under the, the conditions in the early earth. Right. My second short question is, uh, uh, Gary, are you also using theory modeling and simulation techniques to elucidate the origin of life? Um, not directly for the origin of life, but with our colleagues at Georgia Tech, we have carried out uh, quantum calculations and uh, molecular dynamic simulations on the non-covalent polymers. Okay. And uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, before we had the fiber X-ray diffraction structure, which confirms uh, their orientation, we were curious as to what uh, these assemblies look like. And uh, so the uh, quantum calculations and the molecular dynamic simulations actually gave very close, uh, very close structures to that which we eventually got from the uh, fiber diffraction patterns. Cool. And then the second thing uh, that we are attempting to do with simulation is to find the right trifunctional connector, Correct. one that will allow the formation of covalent bonds from us layer to layer in the hexameric assemblies without destroying the polymer. So it has the right length and the right orientation. And uh, in fact, that's what led us to the 
what we call peptide nucleic acids that I showed you that Sunish had prepared. So they are dipeptides linked to a recognition unit. Uh, and uh, they have the right orientation and the right length to form covalent polymers, which Sunish was able to do, but not under prebiotic conditions. Now, I will tell you that one of the things that we are doing now so far hasn't been successful. You know, to form the uh, amide bonds that Sunish did, you need some sort of condensing <laughs> agent. Okay? And there were no condensing agents present on the early earth like carbodiamides. But what we have discovered is that you can spontaneously make thioesters. So instead of a carboxylic acid, if you have a thiocarboxylic acid, under drying conditions, they spontaneously form thioesters. So we are now exploring the possibility that maybe the first backbone was not a, not a amide, but an ester, and in particular, a thioester. And the interesting thing there is that you get exchange. So if you have a thioester and you put an amino acid in place, the amino acid, the amino group of the amino acid, uh, the, the thioacid is a good leaving group, the amino group is a good nucleophile, and you get exchange, you get trans amidation. And so perhaps thioesters were the first proto-RNA, and that in chemical evolution, they got re uh, replaced by amide bonds to make the uh, peptide nucleic acids that Sunish has made. So that's the, uh, one of the lines of, uh, that we're exploring right now. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, Professor Harry, I, <coughs> uh, it's a very interesting talk. I just have a doubt. Uh, see, this uh, uh, prebiotic soup uh, you talked about and the formation of low molecular weight compounds. Uh, what kind of evidence they have? Uh, is it uh, completely proven or? Well, uh, of course, no one was there to gather the chemicals, okay? So it's deduction. What we know is that uh, meteorites like the Murchison meteorite uh, today and in the past fall regularly on the earth and that the chemical analysis of those meteorites real, uh, show that they contain amino acids, that they contain uh, uh, nucleobases, and that some of them contain simple sugars. Mm -hmm. So the three components of the biopolymers of life that exist today arrive with those, uh, with those meteorites, those carbonaceous meteorites. And so they were very likely present on the early earth. Of course, there's no proof of that. It's hypothesis. Okay. Secondly, in experiments that you know, we were talking about a moment ago that uh, replicate the Miller-Urey experiment under conditions that we believe today were existing on the early earth, uh, simple, starting with simple molecules like formaldehyde, formamid, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, very simple molecules that were uh, almost certain pres certainly present on the early earth under conditions that very likely were present, you know, heating and cooling, uh, lightning, electric discharge, hot rocks uh, to, are readily converted into amino acids and nuclear uh, and nucleobases. And so while of course there can be no direct proof there's no reason to doubt that in this prebiotic soup, as it's imagined, that the simple precursors to biopolymers existed. The challenge, and you know, the challenge that we're taking up is, well, how were the right molecules selected from this mixture of hundreds or thousands of similar molecules? And then how were they able to connect themselves to form a molecule that was capable of catalyzing its own replication? And that's the mystery that we're trying to solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.
Okay. Are there any other questions? I, for some reason, cannot get to the chat. So if anybody has, let me see what happens here. Thank you, sir, for your brief presentation. So I have a doubt. Uh, what is the advantage is when non-covalent proto-RNA polymer converted to covalent proto-RNA polymer? Uh, please repeat your question. Uh, why it is advantageous when non-covalent proto-RNA polymer converted to covalent proto-RNA polymer? Okay, so uh, the non-covalent polymer, <clears throat> if you warm it up or change the pH, uh, disassociates into monomers. Okay. And so it has no permanence, which is an advantage because uh, not having permanence allows it to select for the right molecules to arrive at a thermodynamic minimum. And I said thermodynamic minimum uh, several times, but maybe I should have emphasized it because the thermodynamic minimum, if it's the right structure, is the one that arises spontaneously. That's what a thermodynamic minimum means. And so the assembly of these uh, monomers into the hexameric rosettes and then the stacking of these rosettes one on top of each other is the thermodynamic minimum for that system. And so it arises spontaneously. But as a supermolecular polymer, if you change the conditions, it dissociates again. The, uh, another state becomes the thermodynamic minimum. And so the, it's not capable as a supermolecular polymer of transferring information from one generation to the other or catalyzing its own replication. Mm -hmm. In order for it to gain the stability it needs to accomplish those two tasks, we have to convert the non-covalent polymer into a covalent polymer. So existing nu nucleic acids are covalent polymers. They're held together by covalent bonds. And so what we have demonstrated, in fact, what Sunish has demonstrated is that under uh, chemical conditions, we can take these supermolecular polymers and convert them to, to covalent polymers. And these covalent polymers have the stability of, of polyamides. They're stable under a variety of conditions. You can disassemble them and reassemble them many times. And so they have the potential of uh, being able to uh, the information containing molecule and to replicate them. Now we haven't shown that yet. And we haven't shown that we can convert the non-covalent polymers to covalent polymers under conditions that are prebiotic, but that is what we're working on right now. So con that conversion from non-covalent to covalent, what I call the last bond problem is very important and uh, a very great challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the great explanation. Thank you for the question. Good evening, sir. Sir, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Sir, I have an so, doubt. I have an so you are, all the studies so you are, are based the upon the modeling, molecular modeling and simulation, right, sir? No, um, very few of the studies are based on modeling and simulation. Most of them are based on laboratory experiments and observations. Oh, okay, sir. So if uh, for molecular simulations, uh, which software you prefer to use? Is there any suggestions? No. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you're breaking up a little bit. Could you re repeat that so question? For the simulations and modeling, which software you prefer? Oh, uh, it's proprietary software uh, developed by one of our colleagues. Uh, there are two of them. One was, I, I can, if you check our references, uh, you will, there's a paper published in 
I think it's published in Jack's last year, year before. It gives all of the details of the calculations. Okay, sir. Th thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're, you're very welcome. Uh, good evening, Professor. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor, for the wonderful talk. I have a question. Um, can you explain how model prebiotic reaction leaves, gives a clue to origin of life? Since you have discussed this reaction, can be considered as a clue. Can you explain how model prebiotic reaction gives the clue to origin of life? Okay, so the, the, the chemical reactions that we have discussed <clears throat> don't necessarily uh, lead directly to the origin of life. And the, the question that you're asking, or at least the question I think that you're asking, is uh, part scientific and part philosophical. Okay? And so uh, what we are trying to demonstrate is that there is a path okay, from simple molecules that were very likely present on the early earth to a molecule up on, on, that resembles RNA in the sense that it's composed of a recognition unit and a backbone and that it assembles and that it assembles by making hydrogen bonds to other recognition units that are complementary to itself. Okay, that's our goal to make that. Now, can we ever say that that molecule, that proto RNA, as we call it, is the molecule that led to life as we know it today? And the answer to that question is no. We can never ever say that that is how it happened. What we will be able to say is that starting from simple molecules, present, likely present in the prebiotic soup, under conditions that were likely present on the early earth, we can make a molecule that resembles RNA and that through further chemical evolution and then later biological evolution could become the uh, the biopolymers of life today. That's what we can say. We can never say with any certainty that this is the one way that it happened. Okay, thank you, Professor. I think uh, there are no more questions. With this, uh, we are about to conclude the program. I invite Ms. Aradhi Chandran on behalf of School of Chemical Sciences to deliver the word of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the word of thanks for this event to all the dignitaries present here. We have successfully completed the second lecture of three-day online erudite lecture series sponsored by mm -hmm. Kerala State Higher Education Council. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sabu Thomas, on behalf of School of Chemical Sciences, MG University, for his immense support to conduct this program successfully. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Next, I, next, I would like to thank Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Aravinda Kumar, on behalf of School of Chemical Science, for his kind presence and support in today's program. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Gary B. Schuster on behalf of School of Chemical Sciences, MG University. Mm -hmm. He gave us an excellent and informative lecture on the topic, Origin of Life. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful talk. You're it very is welcome. Important. Thank you, sir. It is important to thank Kerala State Higher Education Council for sponsoring such an innovative program. Now, I thank St. Teresa's College, Ernagula, for organizing the program in partnership with School of Chemical Sciences, MG University, and other institutes. 
Next, I express my gratitude to Professor Dr. K. S. Devagi, Director of School of Chemical Sciences, MG University, for all the support and advice for conducting this program successfully. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, you. thank you, ma'am. Now, I thank all the faculty members and student of students of School of Chemical Sciences for their cooperation to conduct this program successfully. Thank you all. Last but not least, I express my sincere gratitude to all the participants who joined with us and made this program a success. Thank you all. And once again, thank you all. Thank you, Gary. Very amazing talk. We all enjoyed. Well, thank you very much. I hope that uh, yeah. it was informative and, uh, and entertaining. And uh, very good. thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to leave now. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Have a very, All right. a very nice day. Someday back, I met you a colleague uh, who's very active in uh, nano and generators. Yes. We know Professor, Professor Wang. Okay. Yeah, met in uh, some meetings, then, you know, we had some interactions and some exchange of mails. So please visit us next time, you know, we will be very ha glad to have you in our campus. I would look forward to visiting India again, uh, as soon as the world settles down a little bit. Okay, bye now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Bye -bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you, sir. Yeah, bye. Bye. So Anisa, why in the PM? Leave you have a level. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. We can okay. leave. Okay. 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 okay, Anisa, thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you all for joining. Okay, okay.